Hi, my name is Tim Bale and I'm Director of the Myelin Institute at Queen Mary University of London. Welcome to another in our series of videos on the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis. Today we're going to see my friend and colleague Sophie Harmon in discussion with Simakai Chigudu from Oxford University and they're going to be talking about the response in Africa to COVID-19. If you enjoy the video, please do share it, please do come back for more, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Since January, I've been keeping an eye on what's been happening with COVID-19 in Africa, particularly because there was the science around the virus that suggested it wouldn't flourish in hot countries, mm -hmm. and also because I was quite interested in African politics in global health governance. Yeah. how we see the continent, how African leaders respond to outbreaks, and also African agency in knowledge and expertise. Mm -hmm. Now, this interest got me looking at the kind of usual headlines we see about Africa, so that COVID-19 is a time bomb that African leaders need to defuse, that it's going to be catastrophic in Africa, particularly because of health systems, which kind of got me thinking two things. Firstly, Given that COVID-19 is particularly catastrophic in Europe and North America right now, what makes it particularly catastrophic in Africa? And why do we speak using the words catastrophe when we talk about the African continent? And secondly, why do we have this kind of higher expectation of African states and leaders to do something when, Africa, sorry, when European leaders don't necessarily respond in the same way? Now, to answer these questions, I thought, why not talk to the fantastic Dr. Simakai Chigudu from the University of Oxford, who has recently published the book, The Political Life of an Epidemic, Cholera, Crisis and Citizenship in Zimbabwe. So thanks so much for joining me, Simakai. Thanks for having me, Sophie. It's uh, really great to be speaking with you. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. So let's just jump straight in then. This kind of time bomb narrative, catastrophe, Mm -hmm. Do we think COVID-19 is going to be as or more catastrophic in Africa as it has been in Europe and North America? It's a really good question. Um, I think it might be helpful for us to take one step back in how we approach our thinking about that question. Um, I've been rereading a lot of interesting work from historians and literary scholars. Uh, one of them is Charles Rosenberg, historian of medicine, who famously argued that epidemics are narratively constructed according to um, a dramaturgy, that mm -hmm. they play out almost like a play um, and do so in a predictable fashion. And this has been a pattern throughout history. You know, they begin at a moment in time with murmurs and whispers um, about an emerging threat. There is a kind of process of revelatory tension as we come to appreciate what is at stake, the lives being lost and the people getting infected. Governments initially uh, begin with, through some process of denial um, mm -hmm. before the accumulation of death and of suffering is far too great to ignore. And then there is a shift towards a kind of societal mobilization um, to address uh, an epidemic, uh, followed by processes of recrimination and redemption at the end of it. We can identify heroes, pace and plot in almost all epidemic stories. Now, I was also reading Priscilla Wald's work, who's written much more um, in detail about the outbreak narrative. And I think that helps us understand what's been happening with COVID-19. You know, a threat that begins in the wet markets of Wuhan is then framed in our kind of global imagination as evidence, yes, of our species at an ecological brink and the emergence of China as a global power, but um, an other um, will tip us into collective destruction. The COVID-19 or the coronavirus itself then becomes this kind of metaphor for the compression of time and space through globalization, such that we become increasingly anxious about the interconnectedness of our world. We shore up our boundaries um, as if that would protect us against a virus, stigmatize those who are seen to be carriers of the disease. And in all of these narratives, what's really struck me, as you've already indicated, is that Africa fits kind of awkwardly. Mm -hmm. I think in the classic outbreak narrative, Africa has come to be understood as the primordial origin of new or emerging diseases. We saw this with Ebola, we've seen this with HIV AIDS, with, with cholera and with other illnesses. Now, with this virus and this pandemic having begun in Asia, Africa is being framed as the final frontier. Mm 
Um, and yet that frontierism has a primordial quality to it, that the poverty and ignorance of Africa and Africans necessarily means that it is catastrophe that looms on the horizon. And it does beg this question, which is fundamentally a political one, about how is it a pandemic can be understood um, as unthinkable in terms of devastation and suffering in one place, yet inevitable in another. Mm. Um, and I think that issue is, uh, reveals how accustomed uh, we are and we've become in reproducing a series of tropes um, about suffering in Africa, about how our visual economy of representation um, is so entrenched with images of, you know, destitute camps and so forth, or, you know, and so forth, or children with malnutrition, as the case might be. Now, within this kind of mixing of tropes, there are some very real concerns about the African continent. Um, urban centers are often densely packed. Um, many parts of the continent don't have access to clean water and sanitation. Um, there are very real concerns uh, about the economic capacity um, with which African states can manage an outbreak of this kind. And I think it's much more helpful to start to break down these individual risks and think about them in a more empirical sense, that catastrophizing um, you know, skips several points of analysis and of thinking. They take us to the end outcome rather than going through the process of what's going to happen in different parts of the continent. Why might some countries be more vulnerable than others? Because certainly Africa is not a blank canvas on which all the epidemic is going to play out in uniform fashion. Absolutely. So I think there is, I really like your kind of points there on inevitability and catastrophizing. And then of course, you know, as we say to all our students with Africa 101, Africa is not a country. <laughs> and this is so huge within the health system because I think a country like Rwanda is going to have the capacity to address an outbreak in a much more different way than, say, a country like Zimbabwe. That's right. And we can learn a lot from Rwanda, even here in the UK, about some of the outbreak and response systems that they have. So there is a nuance there, obviously. But then also this just inevitability that it's going to be catastrophic, that these countries are not going to be able to cope reproduces itself very much so I find. Yeah and it can be something of a self-fulfilling prophecy um, because it conditions the possibilities for response, it conditions the, the assumptions we make in different forms of say collaborating between different sectors of African governance or international partnerships, it conditions the thinking behind say loan mechanisms um, at a time of the squeezing of fiscal space, um, it shapes humanitarian impulses, it also misreads what local expertise might be present, you know, mm. who we choose to listen to in the boardrooms where strategies are formulated about responding to a crisis of this nature. Yeah, and I really wanted to pick up on that actually, about the local expertise, but just African expertise or public yeah. health expertise from the continent. I'm seeing less of what can we learn from previous outbreaks to apply to what happens in Europe. So people say, well, they're low or middle income countries, the health systems are completely different. But basics like test, trace, protect health workers, I mean, they have all been practiced in responses to Ebola, cholera, HIV, yet it's, we're not having this kind of learning process from the continent. That's right. And, and, you know, expertise, of course, is layered, right? So um, when I think about my own work, as I've studied um, cholera in Zimbabwe, um, there is a very conventional scientific expertise that resides among certain bureaucrats or people in civil society within Zimbabwe. Mm. Many of my interlocutors would speak to me and say that they would attend these um, kind of inter um, organizational meetings um, and immediately their authority would be undercut by wherever you know foreign consultant is brought mm. into the room. Um, then there's of course the the expertise which is much more contextual that's got to do with how well people know and understand a given community um, about the social norms um, about behavior, you know, so if we're thinking about things like, you know, social distancing or hygiene measures, those hinge very much on the way people live their day-to-day -day lives. And of course, this is not an esoteric or exotic idea. We know that the norms that govern, say, behavior about households and social contact in Italy differ to those that govern how it works in the UK. Um, and really, it's that textured knowledge of a given society that becomes so crucial uh, for um, implementing the public health measures you've highlighted around testing, isolating and, tra and tracing.
Absolutely, because we know politicians don't end pandemics, it's the people and it's understanding people that does. I mean, it would be funny if it wasn't so serious that, you know, we don't have Zimbabwean consultants coming to the UK to tell us what to do in the government or coming to my local community in East London saying, this is how you keep your distance in the park. We wouldn't even conceive that happening, even though there is that valuable knowledge there. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the... Um, it's hard to it's hard to sort of frame this accurately, but I think that there is something to be said for um, how communities and how societies respond to crises that feel unprecedented. Yeah. And I think in the UK, that's you know it's such an overriding, almost suffocating feeling going through this lockdown because it does feel different to anything we've been through before. In African context, that's not quite so. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we can't. Um, I don't want to romanticize in any way, you know, previous outbreaks, but mm -hmm. just to underscore the fact that actually there is a certain type of learning that occurs during crises and a certain way of understanding the vulnerability of different kinds of systems. Certainly during Zimbabwe's cholera outbreak, this was something that was exposed at such a drastic level. Um, and I think that that's something that is of global learning, that is of global value. Like what are the, the sorts of things that catch you unawares, as it were? Yeah, absolutely. And I've been thinking about a lot this last week and thinking writing on this idea of it couldn't happen here. And I think in yeah. Europe, the UK, there is this like, oh, this doesn't happen here. This happens in yeah. other countries. So that comes back to your first point around the narratives that we have over yeah. the history of outbreaks. So finally, I just want to ask about your book. So The Political Life of an Epidemic, Cholera Crisis and Citizenship in Zimbabwe. So this obviously is about Zimbabwe, but you're talking about this relationship between outbreaks and politics state transformation and sort of political disruption in a way in Zimbabwe. Do you have anything that you would like to say in regards to how that may apply to the UK? I know Zimbabwe and the UK are hugely different, but thinking about similar um, political blindness, lack of political will, and this kind of problems of bureaucracy, I think is starting to play out quite a lot in the UK response to COVID-19. Yeah, so I think um, one of the key messages that I try to explain um, and put across in the book is that, you know, when Zimbabwe's cholera outbreak occurred, you know, it was, um, took place over 10 months. There were 100,000 cases. It spread from the outskirts of the capital city throughout the whole country and then to our neighboring countries. It killed more than 4,000 people. Um, it was really catastrophic. And because it feels like this aberration, in a period of time. It came to be understood as an emergency, a public health emergency. And during an emergency, um, you know, different kinds of social and political actors make an evaluation of what they think is under threat, um, what the nature of that threat is, and how human agency can be mobilized to address it. What falls to the background are the deep and underlying social preconditions that led to that emergency either occurring in the first place or that made it as bad as it was right so in my book there's a lot of time devoted to tracing the long history of um, inequalities in water access in housing access and weaknesses in the health system such that when the outbreak did occur um, it was um, given further impetus by these conditions and in a sense um, that is a lesson to be learned from the COVID-19 outbreak for the UK. Um, the weaknesses within the NHS relate in part to years of austerity in a very, let's say in a very specific way. One of the things that we've seen is the desperate underfunding of public health in this country. A lot of structural reorganization, you know, under the guise of efficiency to introduce different kinds of internal markets in the NHS structure. And the damage that does both in terms of um, loss of personnel, um, in terms of communication systems, and so on. Thus, when the outbreak occurs, you know, we feel unprepared. And it's all of these questions, well, why weren't we prepared? Why didn't we have the right supply chains and so forth? And of course, there's a bigger story here about, you know, transformations related to um, capitalism and industrialization, such that, you know, we're all um, dependent on different parts of the world for the sourcing of whether it's ventilators or protective gear. Mm. And so the nationalism and isolationism, as well as an inability to appreciate how society has transformed, does leave you unaware. And I think for any outbreak, moving beyond the emergency framing and thinking about the deeper social structures that create the conditions for 
um, uh, an epidemic to occur are fundamentally like the key lesson to be learned um, for me. Great. Thanks so much, Simakai. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's a pleasure.